Sounds great. Hey, everybody. I'm here with Tim Pierce. Everybody knows Tim. I knew Tim long before I actually met him in person, which was today. But I've been watching your videos for years on YouTube. That and, shocks me, but uh, thank you. And <laughs> it's an honor to be here. I always wondered about his. Uh, we're, we're gonna get. We're gonna get back to his space in a minute with all his all his his, his cockpit that he has there, which is incredible. But um, very very great to meet you. Oh, you and too. Pleasure to. Uh, it's exciting. Thank you for inviting me here. Thanks for coming. Welcome to L.A. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so Tim. You've been doing YouTube for a long time. Yeah. You were a session guitar player for many, many years. You've played on thousands of records. How many records have you played on? Do you Allmusic.com has over a thousand entries, so you can see that there. And there's probably a few more on top of that. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's really yeah. incredible. Yeah. You've been on huge hit records, many, many hit records. Some, yes, yes. You've been on YouTube for years, too. I have. I started my kind of vision in 2009, and I think I entered the game in around 2012 or 13, just teaching some Hendrix stuff and some other stuff. YouTube was not as crowded then, mm -hmm. so it was a little easier to get established, although uh, you're the proof that you can start anytime. <laughs> well, I was, I was telling Tim that I... All my friends were passing around his videos when when he was you know just five years ago or so yeah. and and it was so interesting to see the your process and how you do it and to see that other people I mean your setup was really kind of how I wanted to have my setup but I couldn't do it because I was working with bands right I like the idea of everything right at yeah. your fingertips and I thought when I saw it I was like ah oh, that is exactly what you need to do well I spent my whole life staring at people's backs because because I would track but I, w I would spend most of my hours overdubbing so we would face the monitors everybody and I'd be tapping you on the shoulder or waving or whatever and so I created a mirrored setup where I could face the client. So when you and I are working, I can see when your mood changes almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Or if uh, it, you can run Pro Tools here, it's totally mirrored, two driver's stations basically, two steering wheels, two mouses, two keyboards. You can do an edit or I can do an edit. If it's quicker for me not to say a sentence and just stop the, the, the machine and do an edit. So my goal here was to shave off five and 10 second increments as yeah. much as possible. But more than that, to be able to read the room and communicate immediately because I'm staring into your eyes. If there's an artist sitting there, you know, a young woman or a young man or anybody, and and I see them light up over something, then I can continue down that path. Yeah. If I see them begin to get uncomfortable or lose interest, that's the other thing. When you're doing sessions, you got to keep everybody really interested. When the people whole time. are saying to you, "Oh, that's great," that right. that you know, yeah, right, and that also yeah. fuels, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Fuel your 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 yeah. creative. Uh, it does ideas. So there's a circle of energy that happens, and the minute I tried it, I thought this might work, it might not. But the minute I tried it, it was like this works great. And there is a little bit of monitor pollution that happens with my speakers. I was wondering and, about that. Well, Jack Joseph Puig has come here a number of times and he convinced me to get these little Genelex so that my speakers don't, they're kind of pinpoint little baby Genelex. Mm -hmm. They keep me from going deaf, but they also make the client's speakers have less pollution. So your your speakers are not polluted so much by the, the, the wash that comes from my speakers back there. So how long have you actually had this setup that you've been doing things? And how has that shifted over the last, let's say, 10 years or so? Well, it started in Sherman Oaks uh, in my other home. And uh, it's been about 15 years now. Okay. And I started, it was really funny. I was doing a record at the record plant for Alex Band from The Calling, his mm -hmm. solo record. And Tal Hertzberg was engineering. We were we in one of the big rooms, I think with Kenny Aronoff and Paul Bushnell and myself. Maybe been a different bass player. But Tal looked up from the console... And he looked at me and said, uh, we're going to your house for overdubs next week, right? And it was like, it's not even that was, was it a, a joke? question. No, it was, it okay. was he, had, he, he didn't ask. He just assumed that we would be doing all the overdubs at my house. And I realized at that point there was no difference in his mind between what he was going to get at the record plant or at my house. And indeed at my house... It was going to be better because we were going to move faster. All the gear was there. Yeah. You know, I created an airplane cockpit so that I could basically reach everything. Because anytime you even bend down to plug a pedal in, you're losing momentum. Yeah. You know, and yeah. if you can just quickly access stuff and make changes on the fly, you're just removing all these little increments of uh, 
Well, momentum and if, stoppers. And, and those, those, yeah, those momentum stoppers are vibe stoppers too, because yeah. Yeah. when you have that idea that you're trying to get, and yeah. you're just like, oh, I got to plug this in, I got to plug that in, I got to move the mic, yeah. you know. And there's no such thing as moving too quickly because you can always redo something. Right. You can always go to another guitar player two weeks and have him paint his stuff with his paintbrushes. I mean, it's. I think it's far better to to get most of it really fast and then go. Oh, <laughs> we should have taken a little more time with that. You can still do that. The door is always open, right? You know, because everybody has their own facilities now, kind of their own places where you can. I guess in the old days with studios, you kind of had to get it then and there, and there was yeah. art to that too. You know, you didn't have the budget to come back next week. You know, next week the money was gone. <laughs> now, do you think that um, that because of this that you're um, more satisfied with the things that 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 you come up with because I am I am and I think people are too because I can pick and choose the amp head immediately I can pick and choose the level of effects I'm going to provide I can the you know what the greatest thing about having this setup is scheduling because if you book me and you don't feel good that day yeah we can cancel. Right. I've got other stuff to do. Everybody yeah. always has stuff to do. And because guitars always happen somewhere in the middle of the process, you can't always do that with bass and drums. Right. If you schedule bass and drums, you got to get it done. Yeah. But for me, the scheduling is the greatest part. We can work until we're tired. Mm -hmm. If something comes in that you need to do that you can't do it that day, it's fine. There's no penalty. That's really been the greatest thing about it. I don't lose work because if I say to somebody, if I say to you, Rick, I can't do it until a week from Thursday. Generally, you can go, yeah, okay. Because so, it's just the two of us. Okay, so if this was 1999, right? Yeah, and you're right. going to a studio in town. Yeah. What would you bring there that, I mean, you wouldn't be able to bring all this stuff. You well, wouldn't bring your, I mean, think you have your mic pre's, you have your, yeah. I at, mean, you have everything here. How at, much stuff would you bring back then? At the height in the mid 90s, yeah. it was basically an arms race, and we all had huge rigs. And I would have, I had, two racks full of pedal boards, my own mic pre, because we started doing that too. I don't know, it was either Michael Landau or Michael Thompson started bringing their own mic pre's. Sure. And so the engineer would just plug in XLRs and you would put your own mic in front of it and then use your own rack effects the way they're supposed to. Yeah, yeah, of course. The, you know, your own little console right there. So I had racks of pedals yeah. and mic pre's and rack effects. And then I had tons of heads and I generally would bring like 40 guitars. So a cartridge truck would pull up and you would basically have to build a miniature version of this at the studio. And how long would that take? Oh, it's, it takes forever. I mean, I would show up early. A lot of the guys always seem to be able to just show up and have their rig going, but I wanted to make sure ergonomically it was in the right place in the room. Yeah. Because a rig like that would really, could really screw up the feng shui of a, a, yeah. a control room. Or sure. So I'd make sure people could walk around. I usually parked at the side of the console so the producer and engineer could still sit in the center. And I'd be in front of one speaker, and they could always bring it over to me if I was doubling apart or whatever. Mm -hmm. I like to be on the side also, because then I could face like this, and I could see everybody. If the artist was back here on the couch, I could see them. I could see producer, engineer, and then I was the speakers were right here. So I would angle myself just like this in front of the console, the SSL or the Neve or whatever. I would show up super early. I'd be there with the cartridge guys. We'd place everything. I remember going to Matt Serletics, even when the rig started to get smaller, and I would array the heads standing up around me here, pedal boards here, guitars over here. You'd build this little miniature cockpit, yeah. you know, just so you could get to stuff really quickly. You know, it's like, oh, you want the Vox, and, or you'd like to try the Marshall. Oh, you want it to be more distorted. Oh, let more clean, or this effect over here. And I had, I had pedal boards, and yeah, so... It, it, it adds, oh it literally adds two hours to the front end of a session, absolutely. And the idea of traveling, I mean, nowadays, thinking about that, do, do, do you kind of get a little nervous feeling? <laughs> I do. I mean, I always used to get nervous driving into Hollywood anyway, because I was always the guy who had no, uh, you know, all the guys I was working with had huge college, you know, educations, and they could sight read and stuff, and I'd show up and make my way through it. And I was lucky, you know. But it, there was always that pressure. But the pressure of having to build a rig... And you know how it is. Sometimes you, the, the engineer would put the microphones in front of the cabinets. And for whatever reason, it didn't sound quite yeah. right. So you'd have to get that worked out. Why is it not exactly right? You know, So you had to literally build a rig and get a sound every time. So yes, I prefer this. I, I plead with people just to come here mm -hmm. for, for overdubs. Yeah. I mean, live off the floor is fine. I did a session. Well, we were at Sphere last week with um, Venny. And Chris mm -hmm. Cheney, Vinnie Caliuta, Chris Cheney, and, and Jamie Mahoborak 
doing Beth Hart's record. She's playing piano, and we're tracking live to her. But for that, I just brought my favorite head right now, which is my park. Mm-hmm. And they have tons of amps which there. Which I just heard for the first <laughs> time, and it's unbelievable. Yeah, I'm glad you liked it. So for that, though, most of it I brought in my car. I don't even ask the question about Cartage anymore because I know, first of all, they have tons of gear there. That's a whole other story. Right. All kinds of cabinets and stuff. But I brought a 112, the park, my pedal board, what I thought might be the right guitars. It's so much more sane. Yeah. Guitar, you know, you, you don't have to have a lot of stuff. We just got into a real arms race here for a while, the 80s and 90s especially. Was it fun, though, a little bit? It was fun, but it was so hard for me to find the right Fox amp. And then it was, you know, you'd show up and go, do you have the Rickenbacker 12? No, I have a Dan Electro 12. Oh, you don't have the Rickenbacker 12. Okay, okay, it's all right. You know, there's all these moments where, you know. (laughs) That's why you ended up acquiring all this stuff. Sure. Because you you never wanted to feel that feeling when the producer would say, yeah, we need an old old telly for this. Yeah, here it is, you know. So we would all just bring all this stuff. And I remember it kind of reached, it kind of started to reverse. At a certain point, people didn't want big guitar rigs in the studio. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing something for Mike Shipley. Mm -hmm. Uh, And remember Mike, right? Of course. And he watched the gear come in and he started to get mad. And he got more and more mad because he just wanted an, he just wanted an overdub. He he wanted a particular thing. But the thing is, you don't communicate. Right. Everybody's too busy. Yeah. You know, you just you well, just show up because you don't want to bother them with, hey, what would you like me to bring? Or maybe you can't reach them because there's layers of management involved. Yeah. But, so yeah, this is better. This is this is so much easier. Okay, so everybody here, you should subscribe to Tim's YouTube oh, channel if you don't already. Nice. Tell me about your channel, Tim. What really drew you to that? Okay, so I always felt that I was going to get fired from the music business because you know it's it's fickle and you know, whatever. So at a certain point, I realized, okay, I'm going to keep working. I guess and part of that was I always chose people in the middle to try and be loyal to. So the people at the top, I would do you know high profile stuff, but the people I really could trust were people in the middle. And mm-hmm. I had all these clients who were just making music. Maybe they're not not the most famous. Maybe there were sometimes quality issues with the music. Uh, except for Rob Cavallo. Rob is was at the top all the time, and he was he's been loyal, one hundred percent loyal forever. That was like the one exception. Mm-hmm. I could talk about that too. But I always collected all these people in the middle who were independent people who were just making their music. And I thought if I can, it's not about the session; it's about the human being and and yeah, the want, relationship exactly. With these and 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 if they can depend on me and want me only, not a guitar player, right? They want me, and that that was really what I tried to do: is try to get people who really wanted to hire me rather than a guitarist on a list, right? basically. So I developed that, but I always thought that this thing would end. And of course it ends. Ultimately, you age out. Right. And so I thought, how am I going to age out? And I always thought, well, maybe I can teach. And I don't know what that's going to look like, but maybe I can teach. But then Brett Papa came over one day and he said, hey, check out my buddy Marty. He's got this huge thing on YouTube. And when I found out that the business Marty was doing was so much bigger than anything I'd even done in the session world, mm-hmm. and that this this thing out there... Well, it's a worldwide audience. That's the yeah, thing. For education. And yeah. I thought, oh, I don't have to shrink what I'm doing I can actually grow what I'm yeah. doing so I started doing the videos and being totally awful on camera and, and embarrassed after two or three years I, f- I got one sort of game going and I still feel like I'm trying to get the game better because what you want to you want to drill down until it's as authentic and as much you of you as possible so what I saw was like all of us the business was changing and it was getting harder to earn money as a recording musician. Mm -hmm. Um, The recording business got, you know, it changed. Decimated, basically. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That's one word. Yeah, right. So I thought, okay, so if I, if I can, if I can do something that's even a fraction of the success of these guys, like Marty, Mm -hmm. and the bass, the bass guy, Scott Devine, Mm -hmm. and the drum guy, uh, Mike Slessons, and, yeah. and and there've been other people along the way too. Now it's 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 you know there are a lot of people doing it. 
But I thought, this is actually a bigger business than my session career. And I just kept doing it and doing it. And we finally monetized about three years ago. And the minute we monetized, it became a successful small business for me. Mm -hmm. I have a full-time film editor, two part-time film editors, a part-time webmaster, and a part-time tabs guy in, in Italy. And so it's, it's a real business. And the thing I like about it is it's a product that I sell to customers rather than a service I provide for clients. So I do not have to be there to earn the money. Right. I can be doing something else as the money is earned. And I've never, I spent my whole life pleasing people, trying as hard as I could to please people, you know, doing overdubs and doing sessions. And it's just nice to be able to make something that people buy, whether I'm asleep or, you know, taking the weekend off. Or it, That's the nice thing about it. I want to ask you about this. When you're doing overdubs yeah. on, on a record, you, you, you know how you have those days where you just can play anything and ideas are just flowing like this? What do you do when you're not having one of those days? It always comes up. And every day is like that if you're actually doing music production because the minute I finish one song and another song gets put up, yeah. Go, well, you're starting over again then. Yeah. And so you try stuff. You really, it's almost like the situation demands that you dig into a well that you didn't know that you had. Mm -hmm. So kind of every day is like that at a certain point. And what I would always, I often would depend on the people in the room to feed me ideas. Yeah. Um, and say, what do you think here? What, what, how about this? And they go, not that. And you go, oh, well, how about this? And oh, that. Okay. So, you know, you have to be able to to keep trying stuff and keep digging. I mean, but it's it's all about improvisation, though. Yeah, it is. It's all improvisation. It yeah. From the every single part that you do, yeah. you're thinking, what chord am I playing over? Yeah. Where is it going? Is this uh, yeah. need to be a high part? Need to yeah. be a low part? And it's frequencies. I, like I would, like, what I would generally try and do because you want to keep people's confidence high at all times. When every, anybody put up a song, I would always try and finish the chorus first. Because once you made the chorus go like this, yep. everybody could kind of go, we got this. Yeah. And then you're just painting in the verse. You're doing sound effects or little R&B parts or little low parts that you can kind of not hear or whatever. So I would take the chorus and go, hey, how about this on the left and this on the right? Now, I saw you talk about this in one of your videos. I'm a big fan of hard left and right. Yeah. And... If the part is doubled, that's one thing, but you can actually play a different part on the right and a different Absolutely. part on the left. And if you treat the sound slightly different, it then you get that wide it stereo. blossoms. So that's that. I would I would try and make the chorus blossom. Do it with frequency. So you might do low eighth parts. You might do an arpeggio in the middle, double that, and then some really high part. Maybe you have three levels of frequency that yeah. you can you can fill and just. So I would try and make it so that when they would run up to the chorus, all of a sudden, because of the guitars that we would quickly put down, the chorus would go boom and open. And once they Frequencies. hear that, yeah, then all of a sudden they feel ah, oh. <sighs> and then, then we're gonna get this. Well, and then the verses are yeah. Then you just you can paint. You can you can just try stuff. You want a Nile Rodgers part? You can use references or not. Um, you know, I was always really good about keeping my cards held here so that. If somebody suggested something, I go, yeah, that's really cool. You know, it's like you want to sound like the Smiths. OK, would it ever come up where you would play a part and you knew it was the part and they said, no, I don't I don't really like that. And would you ever say this is a great part? I think you're wrong. No, never. Me personally, I would never. Would you do would that. you but would you feel that, though? Yes. The, the, the thing I have said about this, it's basically you have to have a big ego and then you have to allow that ego to be annihilated, mm -hmm. and then you have to bring it right back big and strong. And that's some, one of the things that musicians in that game, it might be the hardest thing to do. So you might have a young artist sitting there saying, I don't like that part. And so you really have to, you have to allow, allow your ego to be completely decimated, annihilated, obliterated, <laughs> <laughs> and then bring it back strong with a new part. At this point in my life, I actually might say something. But that's because I have this other business that now is kind of my my main business. So the the sessions now are are kind of like they're they're luxuries now. They're really fun now. You think that the parts that you come up with now because you're in your own environment here 
um, it's easier to come up with things? It is. It is easier. And I, I gravitate towards clients who give me freedom now, too. That's also. Mm-hmm. I think if, if somebody came and tried to dictate what I was doing or completely shot down what I was doing, I, and I've done this in this room, I would say, you know what? It's not going to work. You don't have to pay me. We'll find you somebody. And uh, so, no, wait, wait, wait. And, and it's like, no, this is not going to work. And I, I'm, it's, it's a luxury at this point. But coming up, I never did that. I, I would just, I would, you know, just try again mm-hmm. and wait until they were satisfied. And with some people, it was really hard. I remember I, with Tracy Chapman, I remember she made me try every guitar I owned on a part. Because she would, actually, if we did it too quickly, she didn't trust it. Right. So, you know, you, there, were, there were times when it would just take forever to do the simplest thing. And I was actually good at that. I could, that's probably one of the reasons I worked a lot is that I, I would actually be able to take that heat. Uh, that's your personality. That's at least the personality that I, you know, in knowing you a little bit yeah. and seeing, just yeah. seeing you, you have that yeah. personality. That... Uh, but yeah, and that's the thing. If a young person who has no experience tells me what I'm doing is not good, I can actually be okay with that. As long as the next thing, or maybe the next thing after that, is something that we all enjoy, right? You know, I can live in that in that for five minutes. Yeah, for a while, <laughs> and and I can I can deal with the resentment that naturally you know comes from maybe somebody who doesn't really know that much about music might even you know mm-hmm. be the person saying that it, it happens. Um, okay, so I want to transition into talking about this setup here, and then going into the, the yeah, into right. the cockpit. So. These speakers that we have here, if you play your guitar, yeah. these speakers are going to... Okay, now you are playing through what and where is it being mic'd? Okay. So, so you're in, in isolated, the amp, the cabinet's isolated yeah. in a different room. We're, we're above a garage, a three-car garage, so it is a bigger room than, you know, you walked in here and you were surprised at how big it is. Yeah. So it is a bigger room, but we're, so there's a three-car garage down below. I took one of the bays and I built a vault. Okay. And that vault is not totally soundproof, but it's soundproof enough so that my neighbors are okay. Yeah. You know, you do hear a rumble. The bottom end from a guitar is impossible to stop. It, yeah, you can't. Yeah. So it's, it rumbles, but it, it dissipates enough to where my neighbors, it doesn't bother them, which is, you know, I'm just really lucky that way. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a 412. That's my primary cabinet down there. Which is what? It's a, an old VHD, VHT 412. Okay. And the, interestingly, the bottom is closed back and the top is open back okay so i had it custom made that way okay so i'm do you have I'm, four mics on it or something or? sometimes i do right now i just have two okay uh but, but you're can. going and change mics out and, absolutely and do different yeah yeah okay. and i i i, I, I want to set up some more mics right now some of the mics are down because i actually made the vault bigger uh about a month ago a month two months ago um it was small and i made it now to where you can stand up in it so it's nice it's okay. nice it's a bigger it's almost it's a room actually so the guitar goes into the park amp yep. the park goes into the one the 412 yep the 412 right now has a Royer 122V on it which is yep. their really really buttery uh, tube ribbon and it has a 57 so I'm blending the two they're in phase uh, they come back and right now they're into my Cahayan 1272 which is a Spanish company they're kind of a genius Pablo Cahayan but I love Mark Lohman's BAE my priest too. Use them all the time. So mm-hmm. um, it, it's kind of either or. Are um, they being EQ'd right now, no. or they they're just? I don't do not use EQ on electric guitars okay. at all. Ever, you do the, ever the do. you do the mic blend, or you just adjust the amplifier exactly. or the effect yeah. pedal or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. No EQ ever on electric guitars. Then they actually one side goes through a distressor. If I want to use a mono, you know. Um, See, after the mic pre, they start to go through a few rack pieces of gear. Okay. A distressor, uh, an even tight eclipse for delays, and then right now an H3000 for some retro chorus if I want it. Not much, because I don't want to do too much in the sig- signal path. And then they go to the Apogee, and then the Apogee goes straight to Pro Tools. Apogee Symphony. Are the mics recorded separately into Pro Tools? Uh, I forgot. I forgot. Or do you blend them? <laughs> they blend them. They go out of the Apogee. No, they go out of the mic pre's. Right. This is this is a great thing that Ross Hogarth turned me on to. Mm-hmm. So what I can do is I can put mics into mic pre's and I can blend the mic pre's. So the mic pre's terminate in a Chandler line mixer, really high quality Chandler line mixer. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when they came out with those. Yeah. So 
I'm actually taking the sound of the mic pre on the Royer and the sound of the mic pre on the 57 and blending them through the Chandler. And I've done tests. It's totally discreet, I guess is the word. Yeah. Yeah, it's pure. And so I can take these amp, these mic pre's and go straight to one channel of Pro Tools. And I have blended and, and, five mic pre's. And when you're channel. blending them, you use them to, as your tone controls also, in yeah. addition to the tone controls on the Absolutely. amp. Absolutely, because the Royer... I always describe it like this. The 57 is like a fist for yep. mid-range, and the yep. Royer is like this big pillow around it. Yeah. And if it's a little too transient, mm -hmm. I bring in the Royer around it, and I back off the 57. And sometimes I don't use the Royer at all, because that 57 is the sound we've heard our whole lives. Yes. And it doesn't have, as you've talked about, too much bottom end, because the tendency as a guitar player is to give too much fat bottom end, because it's great. You love it. You just... <laughs> But you take it to somebody like Chris Lord Algae, and they immediately yeah. chop that out. It. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm getting smarter about that, about not putting too much bottom end in in my guitar sounds after 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. All right. So can we? Uh, can yeah. We, let's uh, move back over there. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. So Tim. Describe your setup here. You have your monitor in front of you yeah, with Pro okay. Tools open. Yeah, so the, the, I have the, the keyboard here, and it's elevated because of posture. Yep. And I have this split over here, and that's for the same thing. Being a guitar player and working Pro Tools, it's tough for me. I don't know how guys do it, but the way I've worked it out is by kind of bringing this up and bringing this over to the side. Because mm -hmm. look where the guitar sits. Yeah. And it's still ergonomically, I still have a tendency to lean forward yeah, like but this. That's, that's uh, being a guitar player, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it works great. Then over here is most of the Pro Audio stuff and the, and the mic pre's and the Chandler line mixer. And then I've got tons of effects over here, heads here. Yeah. Um, MIDI controllers down here to access. This is just a Medusa of multiple pedal boards. That's all this is, just stuff connected together and then... Hopefully, noise problems get solved along the way. <laughs> now, these other heads that are there, yeah. if you wanted to, to, to put one in, how long would it take to get it up? Well, so see, if I go to the diesel, I just have to wait for it to warm up. Let me plug it in. I have these Kahayan amp switchers. Okay. And so the diesel is warming up. We're waiting. Okay. And then I always forget which one it is, although it says it's number two and number three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Things change. So now I scroll. Warming up. Okay, so you, you, is you, that putting a load then on the park? The no. Switcher? You, the thing is, that's the secret. You don't, as long as there's nothing going into the park, you don't need a load. You're not going to hurt it. Yeah. yeah. Amps can idle without speaker loads. And now, are these uh, available? These uh, the switchers that you have? Oh yeah, yeah. And there's there's a, there's another company called Ampeat that's it's a good company that's a little. Uh, it, I think it does have a load for every amp you put on. The okay. Kahayan is, is a simpler thing, and these work great. I've used them without issue. They're perfect. They worked great for a number of years now. Okay, so what is actually plugged into the back of there? Are the speaker outputs? The speaker outputs are, are all plugged, are plugged in, in, yeah. Yeah, and they all go t into this matrix. It's basically just a patch bay for speakers. Okay. And a rotary switch that dials all the heads into, you know, you can have four cabinet choices and eight heads. It's great. And I have two of them because I thought I'm going to... I'm going to need more, so I ended up getting two of them. I haven't activated this one yet. But. Okay, so what's what else is in your signal chain? Okay, let me get a, an amp tone back because I was plugged in. I'm going to go back to the park. Yep. And like I was telling you, um, my main amp for years has been the divided by 13 RSA 23, and it still is. It's yeah. just got this gushy kind of warm, modern sounding thing that I can I can make it sound good for anything. But when I discovered the Park 45100, it was like a more um, open and high headroom, higher wattage version of the divided by 13. Yeah. So it's kind of, it can get a little cleaner and more, um, more like I said, more headroom. Okay, I'm tuning really quick. So you have that's, a tuner in line too? I do, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's always there. Because it, it's like, and a lot of the reason that I play these boutique guitars is because they stay more in tune. Yes. When I move fast, the Les Paul is great, but you're kind of always on the G string, right? Yeah. Tuning it. So you can hear how the park is loud and clean. There's, I always find that sweet spot, I call it, where it begins to break up, where it just begins to drive. And that's where I like to kind of create sounds. And then if I want 
And then more you're distortion. using dynamics too for uh, where you can actually, if you dig in a little bit more, you get a little Absolutely. bit more gain. Yeah. It's the whole game. Yeah. Yeah. You know that, yeah. yeah. right now oh no my mic micro amp is on too it's one of my favorite overdrives is okay. the MXR micro amp so it's on it's great it remains the clarity even with a major seventh major nine chord right like yeah that. I'll turn off the micro amp, and this is just the amp. So just adding a little bit. Yeah, just a little. Yeah. I just like I like pedals that explode the front end of the amp. Yeah. Push the front end. And then the ODR one has more gain. It still sounds natural. That sounds great. Now are these uh, so that these pedals are in line right here? And yeah. You're just turning one off and turning yeah, the other on. That's all. It's like the guitar is going straight into this Mo Distortion, which is a rare FET boost. Okay. And then into the ODR one, which is still pretty rare too. Yep. And then the uh, the custom overdrive um, micro amp. Um, so these right now are the three varieties of gain up pedals that I use. And if you want to go beyond that with something, then you would go into the diesel exactly. or another higher gain amp. Exactly. I mean, you, you can't. Yeah, the diesel. There's nothing like the diesel for you know, like high gain soloing and you know, really heavy low chords, right? You really it, the diesel is so great, the VH4. And from what, what I understand, this is this is still his kind of flagship best sounding amp. Mm -hmm. Anyway, good. Now tell me about your rack over here okay. with your rack here. I'm going to walk over to the, on yeah. this side. So not that much is being used here. Like I used to use this API years ago. I'm not really even using it right now. But these I'm I'm using these uh, and I use this for the acoustic. This is out of service right now, but it's a really cool sounding preamp. Um, that's another mixer. Like if my my uh, Chandler ever went down, my Chandler line mixer, I could use that. That's a simpler Kahayan mixer. That's a Brent Averill API that I bought from Michael Landau that sounds really great. This is the Kahayan Mike Pre that's a Neve clone. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a Mark Lohman BAE Neve clone. There's the Distressor, which I use a lot for mono sounds, clean sounds, and acoustic guitar. When I play acoustic guitar, I simply pull this towards me, or this, this C12A, or this KM184, or I have a Sheps CMC5U, and just pull it towards me and start doing acoustic. That's the other thing. If people want acoustics, there's no setup. The monitors go off, the headphones go on, and we're just playing acoustic immediately. So Great. That, that's the idea. It's all ready to go. Here's the Chandler line mixer. So all of the mic pre's terminate in this thing. So I'm blending the Royer through a fifty, uh, the Royer through a Neve into one channel of here, and the fifty seven through another Neve into one channel of here, and I'm bussing those straight to Pro Tools. So they're blended into one mono channel. And I can add. I've had five mics and five mic pre's going at the same time. Do they here. make those those line mixers anymore? I'm not sure. It's pretty old. Yeah. I'm not sure. But there are other choices. I mean, like this is another choice that's simpler. Uh, but but there are a lot of them out there. A lot of most of them are are for. For taking sound out of Pro Tools, right? It's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, But I'm just using it for going in. So that's what happens. And so out of out of the mic pre into a few kind of rack effects. Okay. There was a time when I had three Eclipses sitting here. Yeah. Now it's just one Eclipse and the H3000. This kind of changes from time to time. So if I want to add delay, the great thing about the uh, Eventide Eclipse is that it has tempo on it. So if I want to add my own delay... <laughs> Press the button, go to the tempo of the song, dial it in. Okay, is this post amp, post blend, or is this... Uh... It's the, right before the Apogee. So this is after the mixer. Yeah, so this is the, on the stereo bus right before it goes to Pro Tools. So like, you know, the way it should be used. Is it outputting to, to stereo then? Yeah, yes. and it is stereo because sometimes I still do the stereo yeah. delay thing. Yeah, yeah. It's effective for some things, particularly ballads. Like if you're doing a ballad, and let me 
just get it to where it's a dotted eighth and an eighth, it's still a very effective thing on a ballad to go. And then this is this old chorus here out of this. I try and use we delays. We do volume pedal right there too. Constant. Ready to use. So that's the other thing. I have two volume pedals. One is, <laughs> <laughs> one is before the delays, so yeah. the delays can trail. But my main one is right before the amp, so I'm hiding noise all the time with my volume pedal. So if I turn on my wait, so you have a volume pedal on both ends of the amp, post blend and pre blend. Well, pre yeah, exactly. At two different places. It's one is exactly one is right after the guitar so that everything can spill over afterwards, and then one is right before the amp as a noise gate. Because, like, here's a big muff that I just turned on. Right? It's noisy. Yeah. I just hide that. Gone. Just, I'm, it's like a, it's a, it's like, it's like I'm in my car and I'm driving and it's the gas pedal. <laughs> Hiding that. Oh my god. Yeah, so. It's actually a noise gate that's really accurate. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, I can tailor it however I want. And yeah, just, that you yeah. actually do on yeah. the fly. Yeah, yeah. But I use delays just to make the sound float. I, I try not to ever hear the trail. I just want the guitar sound to float. I want to hear that and even I'll turn it down a little bit so that it just becomes kind of a thing that, that makes the guitar kind of float. And then I have lots more pedals over here, and I have favorites from time to time. Like this Carl Martin tr Tremo vibe is really great because it has a hardwired AC cable, and it's, it has a lot of headroom. Really good. And then this Fairfield Electronics Falling Water. It's like a chorus, but it's not a chorus. Modulation has a gain knob. Because I used to use an old H910 or H949 in the studio to uh -huh. get like uh, a stereo spread. And it's kind of a glitchy, kind of just harmonized thing. So it's sort of like that. And then this MXR reverb right here. It's a great pedal. This little black MXR reverb pedal. I don't know that pedal. Oh, yeah, you love it. The hologram Infinite Jets. It's got a killer reverb. Isn't that cool? I, st I still don't know how everything is plugged in. Is everything are chained here? Yeah, it's really, really. How are you not getting a lot of not noise? Not professional. It's just, you just keep trying stuff. It's basically these GCX loopers okay. chained together. So I have one loop box, right, okay. with eight switches. And out of that are more loop boxes with more switches. And then I have a couple of kind of honesty kind of loop boxes here that I bypass the whole system with to, you know, make sure nothing is, is draining tone. Yeah. So I'm constant. these two boxes right here kind of bypass everything. It's really the most un high tech and most kind of not professional <laughs> i have a friend named michael thompson who gets beautiful sounds the same way you just i'm just stringing together endless amounts but i'm of not hearing loopers. any any noise or anything like that so i'll open it up hear a little hum a little hum okay so if i unplug the input I am, at, all this stuff is adding, like if I plug you have a modulation thing on, or you have a reverb on or something, or? Yeah, it seems like I, who knows what I've got on. Oh yeah. Okay, so there it is. Yeah. Now, let me just plug directly into the amp, and you will okay. see there is noise that I'm hiding. Yeah. So there's a little bit of trickery involved. So here's the guitar plugged directly in. It's noisier. 
It's <laughs> noisier. You know, so I think what's happening is I have buffers and good stuff in all these pedals and all yeah, these loopers. Yeah, that's actually, actually reducing the, the noise. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, and you would you notice a little bit of gain taken away, but not enough to really. I mean, it's like it's it's healthy. So I just try and keep it kind of cleaned up and and um, uh, functional. You know, get a little Leslie pedal down here, the ventilator. I have drawers full of pedals. I even forget about these. I've got modulators here. I've got a phaser and an and old blender. And everything is plugged in. Everything. Yeah, everything is plugged you in. You can just grab any sound you want. Ready to go. Yeah. If you had to unplug all this and plug it back in again, would you know how to do it? No. <laughs> Indeed, I forget how, how... I forget the signal path. I do. I mean, even what I believe it. I kind of I kind of don't. Sometimes I write it down to remember, but I kind of don't know where this cable comes from. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it, it just disappears down there somewhere. But it's da basically that's the signal, you know. That's that's it. <laughs> now the out the the uh, your cable that goes to your cabinet downstairs, yeah. that comes out of the. Where? It's a hole drilled into the floor. I was going to say, okay. So the vault has a hole in the top with a piece of pipe, like yep. you've seen in many studios. Yeah, like PVC pipe. Exactly. Then it comes up, and there's a hole drilled in the floor. Actually, there's three holes now. Right. And all the cables come up into the room. It's right below me, so I am able to run shorter cable lengths. You know, because I have found that if you're, you know, in studios where you take your 50-foot speaker cables, it does kind of take something away. Yeah. So the speaker cable is, you know, maybe 25 feet. It's because it's right below us, the actual. And in fact, you can hear, if you turn those speakers off, you can hear the rumble down below from the garage. Well, that was fun. That was very fun. Tim, thank you so much for inviting me here. And uh, thank you. it was a real honor to be with you today. And Likewise. I look forward to hanging out this week at NAMM. I'll see you there. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Me too. That's all for now. Please subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel. If you're interested in the Beata book, go to my website at www.rickbeata.com and think about becoming a member of the Beato Club if you want to support the channel even more. Thanks for watching.